Oh, I broke him off. That was a good yeah. fish there. <laughs> oh, that's a Kentucky. Keeper Kentucky. Oh, that's oh, a pig. Baby, that's, that's a, a big one. That's a fatty. That's better. What do you got that, gear boy? Boy, that's a nice one. <laughs> I'm not arguing with that. That's sweet. Nice. Yeah, today I'm throwing uh, throwing a pop bar, trying to get a topwater bite. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times the Kentuckys will sit in these areas that are real rocky like this, that has deep water close by. Mm -hmm. So, and early in the morning like this, it's um, you know it's a great time to throw it. Or if you have a lot of cloud cover. So On this, this edition morning, of Fly Fish like TV with Kelly Gallup, cover. we joined Brad Wiegman on Beaver Lake, Even though it's just outside brass, Springdale, cow, Arkansas. Cool. Brad and Kelly are squaring on off, nice. gear guy versus fly guy. <laughs> Few know Beaver Lake better than Brad, who is one of its top guides. Our dynamic duo will be hunting spotted or Kentucky bass. They're not big, but they are unique and challenging. Along the way, we'll see if it's the flies or lures that wins the day. If you look inside his mouth, look, see that? That's a crawdad inside there. So basically, he was, well, he was hungry. And that does a number of things. First of all, it makes the fibers twist together easily. But secondly, you make sure there's no ugly bumps or, you know, messed up material in there. In our fly tying segment, we get a lesson in dubbing it's hair for bodies. Davey Watton has the demonstration in this excerpt from Wet Fly Tying, a Fly Fish TV instructional video. You can manipulate it. You've always got control of the fly. In this week's instructional, Kelly is back to deliver us some pointers on fishing big streamers. He tells us a thing or two about getting all you can out of your large articulated streamers. All this coming right up on Fly Fish TV with Kelly Gallup. This edition of Fly Fish TV with Kelly Gallup is brought to you by Clackacraft Drift Boats. Fear no rock in a Clackacraft. Sims, the choice of professional guides worldwide. St. Croix Rod, the best rods on earth, including the Kelly Gallup Bank Robber. Alaska Sportsman's Lodge, unequaled angling and accommodations in Alaska. And Scientific Anglers, now offering Kelly Gallup Screamer Express fly lines. That was a pretty uh, brisk run up here. Brad, how, how big is this res? I mean, we're doing 70 miles an hour for quite a while. <laughs> it's a... Uh... It has 427 miles of shoreline, and uh, it runs about 62 miles long if you follow the river channel. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can go quite a ways from dam to uh, where both the tributaries, the White River and War Eagle meet. Mm -hmm. And what we're fishing here is, uh, is the cut through, it's Horseshoe Bend area. And What's the best top water time of year? Uh, I would say best top water time of year is uh, in the fall. Right now, we have a lot of uh, good top water fishing. After the lake turns over, when it's still kind of turning over, uh, it's not always the best. Uh, I, I just put on something that looks a lot like what you've got on. I'm just trying to imitate everything you do. It's, a, it's called a heifer groomer or a fathead. It's just a big deer hair head. So I know there's black bass, Kentuckys, smallies, whites. What else is in here? Uh, well, we have uh, a lot of crappie, mm -hmm. um, walleyes, um, catfish. We have all the species of catfish, flatheads, channel, channel cats, um, just about everything. A lot of brim. What about those giant stripey things on the wall? Yeah, um, 
this is uh, one place where a lot of people come and uh, catch stripers. Is it time? Yeah, it's time. We'll, uh, we'll turn around and go back through there okay. and try and throw a, a different bait at them going back through. When you look at the bank, like mm -hmm. for a bass fisherman, we look at things like this, like it goes from pea gravel and it's going over to this transition right. and it's going over to this rock. And when you start seeing them, now you got to remember though, when the water's up higher, usually, you know, when the lake level is mm -hmm. up higher, because normally this is six foot higher, then uh, uh, some of this you wouldn't see. So a lot of the guys are that. He's still looking at it. Oh, that little guy. Come on. Oh, there's another one. Oh, oh. Shoot. sorry about sorry. that. <laughs> oh, he, I was watching and he just came from nowhere. Yeah, there was one right behind him too. Love that noise. Oh, you got to try for that now, don't you? Oh, it's going for the cup. Spots like this and the water's over it six foot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's perfect like for a crankbait early in the year where bass will get around that. Mm -hmm. you know, oh you yeah, that's like a good that, one there. Yeah. Nice. Come here, little buddy. That's a spotted bass. How do you tell that? Uh, see the uh, spots on the side towards right. the belly? Right. And then its jaw doesn't go extend past, its, past eye. its eye. And he's got a little red eye too. Yeah, did you feel his tongue? Yeah. That's a yep. crawdad inside there. <laughs> so basically he was, well, he was hungry. <laughs> Well, I understand why there's two hooks on some of the bass baits, mm -hmm. like topwaters and stuff. Mm -hmm. Tell me why is, why is two hooks good well, on a fly? It's not, it's not really, it's more because when we tie them, we put materials on the back hook. Actually, the keel, the hook, the back hook really helps. Got him? Yep. Got nice. Him. He's a puller. Yeah, he's a puller. I think he has a complex. <laughs> That's a little bigger fish. Yeah, it's nice. a large mouth there. See the difference mm -hmm. in, the, in the fish you caught? Yep. Of course, I don't know if it really counts that my fish isn't, um, you know, it's this size and yours was that because yours had a oh, crawdad oh. in his mouth. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, if I had to fish Beaver Lake, because mm -hmm. you, you fished, you know, we were down here and we've been fishing, mm -hmm. is that's the rod right there. You know, I think if I were you, I'd go to a seven. This is a six, but it just gives you a bigger line and makes this casting easier on the bigger, this distance, it wouldn't be a problem at all. You were asking me about lines. Yeah. Nowadays, everybody has specialty lines. SA's got, I don't, you know, I should know this because I work with them, but I'm guessing a hundred different lines. Wow. Maybe. I don't know. And they've got specific lines that are, it's all about the taper, you know, how much mass is in one part of it or another. And they've got bass lines and striper lines and, you know, you name it. I think uh, with the new technology, obviously in a lot of the things that you talked about, it, I think more fly people, more bass anglers would be fishing flies. You know, I guess it all comes down to education. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, I know a lot of pro bass guys that they do it for fun. I, where I lived, they did it in the spring because topwater bass, you know. Oh, whoa. oh yeah. Oh, God, oh. broke him off. That was a good yeah. fish there. Duck, 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 duck. <laughs> 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 he, that's He's 12, going in the lake after that's him. That's a 12 pound tippet, man. So, oh, one just, but there he is. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, so he came back and busted it again. Here we go. Come on over. Here we go. Oh, that's a Kentucky. Keeper Kentucky. On Beaver Lake, Kentucky's have to be 12 inches to keep. They just don't get as big as largemouth. Mm -hmm. Takes them a long time to grow. But that one, probably 12 inches. And they're aggressive. 
I want to know when my lessons come, when my fly fishing lessons come. Hey. Oh, that's oh, a pig. Baby, that's, that's a, good a one big one. That's a fatty. Whoa. You need some help? Or no? Oh, we do. You want it? No, I'm all right. That's a keeper. That's a nice Kentucky right there. Hey. That's Redemption. A nice Redemption. He's almost. Oh, put that. Put that little jumpy thing. Two hooks, you don't really want to reach in on those. Nice. That's better. What do you got that, gear boy? Boy, that's a nice one. <laughs> I'm not arguing with that. That's sweet. Nice. You make sure there's no ugly bumps or, you know, messed up material in there. Next thing. Just ahead on Fly Fish TV very, very with Kelly Gallup, Davey Watton has some great information on how to go about dubbing with hair fur. With this particular kind of material, just spread it out nice and even. See, it's natural fiber. It compresses very, very easy. This is natural fibers, hair fur. And what it pretty much amounts to is this. When you get that block of dubbing out of the box, just very, very gently just tease it out towards you like this. And what that does, it brings the fibers into a lengthwise direction. And when they're in a lengthwise direction, and I'll show you something here on my fingers. If you draw those fibers out in a lengthwise direction, see how easily they twist together like this. So essentially what I'm showing you here is that I can produce a dubbing noodle like that in my fingers. All you're doing in the process of actually producing a dub body on the fly is the same thing but you're surrounding that around thread, and it's the thread that enables you to wind it around the body of the fly. So if you learn to do that in your hands, and I, you know, I can reduce this down absolutely as fine as I want, essentially what you're doing is the same thing with the thread base. Okay, now bear this in mind. When you get that blob of dubbing, just ex extrude it out into a lengthwise direction. And that does a number of things. First of all, it makes the fibers twist together easily. But secondly, you make sure there's no ugly bumps or, you know, messed up material in there. Next thing is very, very loosely attach that to the thread base. Don't apply any compression at this point of time with this particular kind of material. Just spread it out nice and even. See, it's natural fiber. It compresses very, very easy. It requires very little compression to actually cause it to surround that thread base. So what you've got is a perfect distribution of material from top to bottom. If you don't have that, you're not going to produce a good dub body. If you've got like diminished volume of the material, you've got big lumps or bumps or whatever, it's not going to happen. Okay, now, remember what I said to you, why, the reasoning why we kept a little ways back from where we're initially going to start that body. And it's for this simple reason. You're generally going to end up with some bare thread at that point. But what you're going to do is reverse the thread back to the position where the body's going to start. And it should be the position where the material starts to attach around the shank of the hook. Now let me explain another little trick to you. Depending on how you compress the material, it has a relevance to the effect of the body of the fly. In other words, if I wind this body as is right now, I'm going to have a fairly bulky flyaway effect body. But if I want to tighten that up and make a tight body, I'll show you a really quick way to do it. Just, just grab the dubbing at the bottom end here like this. Don't have to touch it anywhere here. Yeah? Just twist it. See that? Tightens that up. As tight as you want it to get. I don't particularly want that effect in this fly, so I'm just going to back that off. All right. Now we're going to wind the body. And each time that I do that, so I kind of bring my finger back and I, I kind of tap that material back. And I'm watching all the time as I'm moving forward the profile I'm, I'm actually building up in the body of the fly, but ultimately what I'm looking for is that the last turn I make, there is no material left on the thread. I have none to drag off, and we're clean, ready to accept the hackle. And so the first fly that I articulated it with any success at all was just this basic T and A. It's two hooks, short shank up here, back hooks back there. Coming up on Fly Fish TV with Kelly Gallup, we get tips from Kelly on fishing articulated streamers. Types of motion, and it was a super positive hookup because we had the front hook. This edition of Fly Fish TV with Kelly Gallup is brought to you by Clackacraft Drift Boats. Fear no rock in a Clackacraft.
Sims, the choice of professional guides worldwide. St. Croix Rod, the best rods on earth, including the Kelly Gallup Bank Robber. Alaska Sportsman's Lodge, unequaled angling and accommodations in Alaska. And Scientific Anglers, now offering Kelly Gallup Screamer Express fly lines. Was I happened to be fishing behind a couple guys I know, and they were fishing a jointed Rapala. And it was just a sequence of events, but everybody knows how successful a jointed Rapala is. This is a standard Rapala. A jointed Rapala is broke in the middle, and it swims like this. And I started looking at how we were articulating our flies, and that's when we started doing, when you looked at the Rapala, it has two O-rings that are set like this. So they're the, the back hook kind of rotates on it. So what we did is we switched to ring eye hooks in the back so it's a flat eye like this and then your loop coming out of your front goes into the eye like that. So now we're establishing not only a bigger fly, a short shank hook, but now we've established the S swim. That was incredible. So the next one that came to be was the bunker style, the TNA bunkers. And what these were first designed to do was to be uh, alewife patterns for the Great Lakes. And the big browns were just, just hoovering these things up. So that's where this kind of the transition, it went from gray to green to rainbow striped. So what you've got here is you've got a whole bunch of different pattern styles. There's many, many, many more. These are just the ones I pulled out of my fly box. There are an enormous number of tires that are out there that are articulating flies and coming up with stuff. Not all these are my flies. A lot of them are, not all of them. But it's just, it's a, it's a unique thing. It's really fun. You've got multiple things that are triggering the fish. I like two directions. I like to either go straight across and start it. And even if you go straight across, you really are gonna get the head going down a little bit anyway. Sure. What I don't like to do is have you know, kind of the old traditional thing where people throw downstream and swing it like this. I don't like to back the fly into the fish. I like it to be coming broadside, ideally broadside or just slightly head, just like that, just a little bit downstream. And a couple of things that happens that way, you know, kind of the theory is that a escaping minnow yeah, it's not going to go up current and stick his butt into some, you know, into the fish's face. And, you know, one of the misconceptions of sinking lines is that they're hard to cast. And then you'll hear people say, oh, I can't mend them. But really, you're not looking to mend it. That, that little bit of belly that gets in the fly, in the line, I mean, helps it. You can see it. All you got to do is barely touch the line and the fly manipulates yeah because there's tension on the line you're static to the fly another thing i like to do with the fly is uh, especially when i'm fishing with a, a floating line and it's called a switchman where i'll if i've got a bank this isn't ideal here but if i've got a bank i'll run it out and i'll run the fly's head upstream give it two or three, and then I'll do a switch mend and then turn it sideways. Sure. And I tell you, I get so many eats when you do that. You set it, you set the fly out head first, twitch it upstream, then you do your downstream mend. You get lots of action out of the fly. No matter how fast you want it to go, you know, if you want to start ripping it through there like that, or if you do like just a subtle jig thing like we were doing earlier, you can manipulate it. You've always got control of the fly. When we were talking about the, the jerk strip, I jerk the rod, strip the excess, jerk the rod, and you get that manipulation with the fly. And your rod really stays in the same spot all the time. You know, you're, you jerk, you strip, you jerk, you strip. And you're always, that's what we were talking about, you get that opportunity to set no matter if you're in, where if you're in mid, you know, you jerk, strip, jerk. No matter what, if you, you know, if he eats it while you're jerking on it, you get a piece of them. So basically to wrap it up on these flies, what we've done is we've tried to make flies, A, that swim with an S swim, project a big profile, lots of profiles, so it looks like an actual minnow, but we're trying to keep the flies light because they're designed to fish basically with a sinking line. If you're going to do it on a floating line, you might have to throw a little cone head on your leader or a tungsten bead or something like that. 
but for the most part, these are just trying to project a big image without being super heavy and really fun to fish. Man, what a fishery. Well, I, ex we'll I expect back. you to come back down soon, so. Well, about the first picture you send of a 20 pound striper, I'm gonna be, I don't know, I don't know if my marriage could take another week of me being gone, but. Honey. <laughs> 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 That's it for this edition of Fly Fish TV with Kelly Gallup. We hope you enjoyed the show and that you'll remember our sponsors and guests who made it possible. A special thanks to Brad Wiegman for taking us fishing and having his friend Dr. Mark Powell put us up. Also thanks to Davey Watton for once again showing us an extra thing or two about tying. Not to be forgotten, thanks to our host Kelly Gallup for providing his expertise and fly fishing friends in his quest to make us all better anglers.